Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks for uh, being interested in this subject. Um, even though it's uh, a payment system from very far from this place, uh, it's still a payment system and we're talking about real money here. Okay, so, well, I'm doing all kinds of stuff, uh, Linux kernel development, um, uh, research and communication protocols, among them RFID, DEC, GSM systems, and so on. And I feel a little bit like four years ago when I last was uh, involved with OpenPCD and open source RFID reader. That's sort of really the last point in time when I, when I did RFID work. And in 2010, in August, I decided, well, let's, let's have a look in how things have developed in the last four years. And I was really surprised uh, to see what I see. So how did I end up with looking at this system in the first place? Well, starting from 2006, uh, I was doing a lot of freelancing work in Taiwan. Um, and uh, this resulted in a number of business trips uh, to Taiwan and specifically to the capital city of Taipei. Um, in Taipei, as soon as you use public transport, you will see that almost nobody buys a single ride ticket, but everyone uses a small plastic card called the Easy Card. That's the English name, at least. Um, if you literally translate the Chinese name, it's more the easy travel card. But um, yeah, it's called easy card. And it's supposed to make public transportation easy. Um, this was just after having worked a lot with OpenPCD and OpenPICC projects um, uh, in the RFID area. But uh, have, given that I was on business trips, I never really had enough time to look at the easy car system. Until in 2010, I thought, ah, yeah, well, let's give it a try. So what's this easy card? Um, this is, uh, as you can undoubtedly uh, recognize immediately, a, a screenshot of Wikipedia on the subject of EasyCard. So you actually see it's a contactless smart card system, who operates it, and so on. Um, you see an actual EasyCard on the bottom right-hand side. Um, so it's a, you know, just like any, any uh, credit card-sized uh, um, RFID card, just has a couple of strange colorful spots on it. Um, and as you can see already in this public website, even Wikipedia knows it is based on MyFair, right? Um, so uh, MyFair being, well, I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. Okay, so it is a car that's used in Taiwan, mostly in the capital city of Taipei. Um, it was originally deployed in 2001. That's what I found, uh, well, according to Chinese sources. Um, according to Wikipedia, it's June 2002, so there seems to be some off by one error. Um, there are more than 18 million issued cards, so it's not a small niche market or something. It's 18 million cards. It's quite a substantial user base. And it was initially only a payment system for public transportation, mostly for the Taiwan uh, Metropolitan, Rap Rap Metropolitan Rapid Transport, called MRT, which is their subway or metro, or whoever you want, uh, whatever you want to call it. There are also public buses that uh, use the same card for payment. Um, it's thus, it's very similar to other RFID contactless uh, um, public transportation systems like the Oyster Card in London or like, you know, any major city you travel to, um, except Berlin or except any German city, as far as I know, you, you have these RFID cards. Um, now, um, if you look at the Easy Card website, you find, you know, what it's being used for. So you have the Taipei Metro, you have bus services, also a rail line uses it for payment. All the government-run parking lots, some privately owned parking lots, roadside parking meters, a uh, mono, no, it's not a mono, it's cable car, the Maokong gondola, some riverboat services, you know, bicycle rentals and taxis. So that's mostly transportation um, uh, that you can pay with it. Um, the system, well, um, the cards, you can buy them at machines. It's like a, a ticket machine. Instead of getting a ticket, it, you know, you get the, the easy card. Um, it's located in every subway station, and I'm quite sure there are more, but at least in every subway station, you find a couple of those machines. You pay 500 NT dollars, which is something like 12 euros, to give you um, some uh, you know, idea what that is. And of those 500 NT dollars, 400 NT dollars are the actual value that you can spend, and 100 NT dollars is a deposit on the actual card. Um, the payment while obtaining the card is made in cash at that machine. Um, thus, since you pay with cash, there's no credit card or account number or anything linking a particular card to a particular individual. There's no uh, connection. Which, well, for, you could say for privacy reasons, that's a good thing. Um, 
I agree it's good, but still, you know, it's pseudonym it's it's not anonymous, it's pseudonymous because you just don't know the association, but you still have tracking profiles of each and every individual who's traveling, but then who cares about privacy in uh, those countries anyway. Um, so, also another feature of the system is that you can get a full refund of the account balance at any given point in time, and even the deposit of the card itself by going to a counter and, um, well, returning the card and, and getting the money. Adding value to the card is made by the very same machines which are located in subway stations that sell the cards. So you, you put in your card, you put in some bills, some banknotes, and you, you get back your, char your card that has a higher value charged onto the card. Which, well, um, you know, all in all is, you know, very interesting. But then if you look at how, what, what can you pay with that card, you know, a public transport ride, which in Taipei costs you something like, uh, maybe 12 to 20 NT dollars, which is, you know, something like, uh, you know, a couple of cents up to, up to 50 cents, euro cents. Um, that's not really some, you know, very attractive target for anyone. It's, you know, a couple of cents here and there. Yeah, sure, but uh, it's, you know, the, the, the fraud potential, you know, the public transportation company might, may think it's big, but I think it's not really, you know, when fraud potential is very, relatively limited. Um, so, well, it's publicly known that the EasyCard uses this NXP MyFair solution. Um, MyFair Classic, specifically, has been broken in various ways before, um, ranging from eavesdropping attacks, recovering the keys from recording conversations, to card-only attacks, where all you need is the card to recover the keys. There are so many different attacks on MyFair. Um, uh, I don't really want to repeat all of this here. Um, however, one thing to remember, and I mean, this, this talk is not about cryptographic attacks or, or anything like that. It's, it's a, you know, a practical real world attack using the, the, the tools and the cryptographic methods that have been developed before. One thing to remember is that the card itself is only one element in the security chain. So even, you know, even if you see, oh, you know, the system uses my fare, it must be broken. It's not that easy, um, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the statement that they use a MyFair card doesn't really mean the system is broken. Um, they could have done it in a way that it's not so, you know, not, not a big fraud potential. The big question it all comes down to is there online or offline verification, all right? Um, if the value, the amount, the balance, your account balance, if that is stored only on the card, then of course manipulating the card is a very dangerous uh, uh, proposition because you can manipulate the value. Um, however, if you actually store the value in, in the backend database and you only use the card as a means of authenticating the user to his account but do all the transactions on the backend to the online, uh, online or to the database, then, um, well, then there wouldn't be really that much problem. Um, because, well, uh, if, even if there's a cached value on the card, if you manipulate it, the next time you make a transaction, it checks the central database and there is your real, the real value, the real balance of your card, and uh, it is determined that there is something wrong and it, it uses the value from the backend system. So I never, as I said, I mean, I've been in Taiwan since 2006, I never really looked at the system because I thought, well, you know, First of all, it's only used in public transportation, um, and subway stations are, you know, they're not that many. So it's not, it's, it's very well imaginable that they do online verification because, you know, what Taiwan, I don't know how many subway stations Taipei has, it's, let's say it's 40 or 50 maybe. Um, that, you know, it's very easy to have leased lines there and access the central database. The other thing is, well, you know, as I said, free rides, uh, it's not a very, you know, not a very big uh, problem, I think. Now, in, unfortunately, you could say, in 2009, the government has created laws for, uh, they call it stored value cards. I'm not quite sure if that's a term that's really used in English. I'm not a native speaker either. Um, for a means of payment. Basically, they, they created laws um, that, so electronic cards uh, where you can deposit some money uh, can be used as, as legal uh, payment system. Of course, the Easy Card Corporation being the only one act actually having deployed such a system in Taipei, you can, you can guess that it was uh, specifically passed uh, for, for enhancing the business of Easy Card. Now, so in early 2010, I think it was 1st April, the use of this Easy Card ex is extended beyond public transport. So now you can store up to 10,000 NT dollars, which is 240 euros, so not a, you know, a significant amount of money, giving the local purchasing power of, of that money. Um, 
And uh, the card is suddenly accepted by a lot of stores, mostly the big brands, the franchises, and so on. They all suddenly accept that card as means of payment. So suddenly the incentive is much higher. You can't only get on free metro rides, but you can suddenly buy about anything that costs less than 240 euros uh, in even the largest department stores that the town has to offer. If you again look at the website, you know, these are the designated stores. You may not recognize many of them if you haven't been to Taiwan, but uh, it's basically, you know, most of the places you run into. 7-Eleven, Family Mart, OK Mart, and High Life are the four um, uh, convenience store franchises that you find, you know, every, every hundred of meters or even less, you will find one of them and they sell about anything. So, uh, those are, you know, tens of thou thousands of, of stores. Welcome is the largest, um, um, supermarket, uh, uh, chain in, in, uh, in Taiwan and Hong Kong. And, uh, there is, uh, stuff like Watson's, which is a drugstore, Starbucks, everyone knows Starbucks. So, you know, coffee, so on. I'm, I can go, you know, Pizza Hut, Domino's Pizza, and so on. And also Sogo, which is a very large Japanese um, uh, department store uh, chain that has uh, various uh, department stores in Taipei City. Uh, you can also get sushi and, and Cold Stone is, is ice cream. So uh, basically, you can get anything. Um, okay. Now, the card uses a MyFair Classic system. Um, uh, by the way, it used to be called only MyFair, and then after some advances in security research have been made, they have retroactively renamed it to MyFair Classic. Um, so it, it's a 13.56 megahertz RFID system. It's magnetic coupling. Um, it uses uh, ISO 14443, uh, 1, 2, and 3, but it does not use ISO 14443 4 which means that up to the anti-collision level, it uses the same protocols that, for example, electronic uh, travel, do uh, yeah, you actually call them travel documents, electronic passports and so on use. However, the upper layer is not the same that is used with those passports. They provide something like one to four kilobits of storage, um, which are divided in sectors and blocks. Um, and uh, they use a proprietary 48-bit cipher called Crypto One. Um, uh, you know, proprietary N48 bit should ring at least two alarm bells. Um, oh, actually, it, it uses a proprietary 48 bit symmetric cipher, right? It's a third alarm bell. Um, and uh, manufacturer and customers really believed in security by obscurity. That's something that I personally never understand. How could anyone who is uh, in charge of IT security of any system that uses my, a MyFair-based solution, right? Yes, it's proprietary and so on, but you know, it was always publicly documented it's proprietary, 48-bit stream cipher. No, a symmetric cipher, sorry, symmetric cipher. And if you are in charge of IT security of any organization and um, you are to deploy some, something that you know, affects your business, it's, be it an access control system where that card is the only factor in authentication or being it an electronic payment system, um, yeah, it, I don't know how anyone responsible could, could, uh, could use such a system. So nobody should have ever used it for any application requiring any sort of security. The weaknesses in the Crypto One and the MyFair system have first been published three years ago by Hendrik Plötz and Carsten Nuhl at this very same event three years ago. Um, if some of you remember, uh, there's been, their initial presentation has uh, triggered a lot of academic research in the Netherlands and other countries, various universities. Um, and based on their initial weaknesses uh, and uh, all the security and cryptographers looking into it, a number of uh, real world attacks have been developed uh, from various different ways. Now, if you want to analyze the easy card, well, there's a couple of things we need to do. First thing is we need to find out if it is really a MyFair Classic card. I mean, it could be just that somebody heard it and put it in Wikipedia or something. Um, and that can be very easily done by, you know, applying the compatible air interface. By the way, this, a four is missing. It's ISO 14443, um, not 1443. Uh, and uh, do the anti-collision procedure and check the result values you get from there. Um, that's very easy. You can do that using OpenPCD or any other RFID reader and so on. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's a straightforward thing. The next step, of course, is, well, you want to recover the keys. Each of the sectors on the card can have two different keys, as key A and key B for 16 sectors gives you uh, 32 keys. Um, 
uh, many cards that you will find in the real world have one or more sectors that use the default manufacturer keys. So there are some keys that the manufacturers, when, when they build the silicon, there are some default keys um, for all the sectors. And um, in many applications that use MyFair Classic systems, you don't need the, all of the sectors, right? If it's just a card that you use for a copy shop or something, the copy shop doesn't need to store four kilobits of data on the card. They just want to store your customer number or something. It's not four kilobits in size. So what do they do? They only use a single sector of the card and all the other sectors uh, remain at the same uh, manufacturer default key. If that is the case, you can break the keys very easily. There is one particular attack where you authenticate to one sector using the known manufacturer key, and then you escalate from there by authenticating against uh, a different sector. And that, that's a very, very quick attack. Um, it has been publicized. There are open source tools for it. Um, so the first uh, try I made was, of course, to look at uh, whether the easy card on any of the sectors uses the default key. Unfortunately, it does not. Well, fortunately for them, unfortunately for me. So. Um, uh, there is a different type of attack. Uh, it's called the dark side attack. I'm not quite sure why the author called it that way. Um, there is a paper by Nicolas uh, Courtois, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's generally referred to as the dark side paper. That paper is public, and it describes how it works. Um, and there is an open source implementation called MFC UK. Um, you can probably understand uh, why that is. Um, and it's the MyFair Classic Universal Toolkit, of course, um, as it's pretty obvious from that name. Um, the hardware you need for doing that is basically, well, MFC UK is, is a program that will do the key recovery using LibNFC. LibNFC is lib near field communication. It's a library that can talk to a number of uh, RFID readers from various different vendors that all use the same ASIC, the same actual uh, chipset for, for uh, the protocol. The cheapest reader you can find, uh, new, costs you about 30 euros. So you need a, 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 an NFC-supported RFID reader, 30 euros, um, install libNFC, install MFC UK, um, and um, then uh, you start the program, and you can start to recover the keys. Um, it took about three hours to recover all the 32 keys. That's sort of you know the massive amount of time it needs. Um, and the attack time could be much shorter uh, if you were using more expensive hardware on the reader side. This attack ba the, the attack um, is based on the fact that uh, the random numbers generated by the card are not really random. They're deterministic, and they're only determined by the amount of time passed from powering up the card until you send the command. So by always powering it up and sending the same command at the same point in time, um, you can make, you know which random number the card will have, and you know it's always going to be the same random number. So it, in fact, it is not a random number at that point. Um, and doing this over, you know, USB attached, uh, all in software on the PC over USB attached peripheral, the timing you can do is not, you know, timing accuracy and the latency over USB from software through the operating system onto the reader is, is very, you know, suboptimal, so you cannot do as many cycles as you could do with something like the Proxmark, which is a, a specific, uh, more research-oriented RFID reader, um, where inside the FPGA and the microcontroller there, you can implement all this, and it has been implemented um, in the firmware, and you can do many more cycles. So I, I haven't tried it, but you can get the attack time. If I was guess, I would say, you know, you should be able to get it down to half an hour or even less. And that means you put the card, you know, the, any random card, you put it there and it will do its job and afterwards you have all the keys for all the sectors. Um, now, uh, next thing is we have recovered the keys. We obviously we want to read what's in the card. Once the keys are known, um, the full data content of the card can be dumped. We can just read all those 1024, 4096, whatever amount of bits it is. There's a software program called NFC MF Classic program. It's just part of the lib NFC, where you tell them these are, these are the keys, now give me a complete dump of the card. Again, the, hard, the reader you use is the same reader. And uh, after you do that, you get something that looks uh, like, let me just open uh, some. Um, just a second. I'm going to increase the font size, don't worry. Um, oh get something that looks like, oh, this is still not. Uh, 
Um, this. All right, this is the hex dump of the card content. So it looks something like this. You get lots of hex numbers. You don't really know what they mean because all you get is a raw dump of the card, of course. So we can see, you know, there's you know some some uh, blocks that are completely zeroed out. Um, here again, we have lots of zeroed out blocks. That are, here is an entire sector. A sector is always four blocks. Is also completely zeroed out, and we find more zeroed out sectors if we go towards the end of the card. It's always only zero. Okay, so we see some hex numbers here after we have read the card. Um, sorry for that. Too, too many, too many desktops. Virtual ones, of course. Where is my, where did it go? Oh, I think, uh, now I know what happened. Uh, stupid me. Um, there we go. Sorry for that. Around here. Okay, so um, we use that, we read out the card. Now we need to understand how is the data organized on the card, all right? Um, so the logical approach to this is you do individual transactions, like you go into the subway, um, you read it before, you read it after, and then you compare what has changed in the data. And you do that again, you leave the subway station and you look what has changed again. Then you make a purchase, you recharge the card, you go into a bus, you rent a bicycle and so on. You do all these things and all the time you do captures, you reread the card again and see what's happening. In the subway station, that's, uh, I mean, there's always video surveillance, so it might be a bit suspicious if you, you know, you walk through the toll gate and you unpack your laptop and, you know, you have your reader and stuff. It might be a bit suspicious, especially considering, well, there's both video surveillance and there's always a guard at every station. It's, there's no, no unmanned stations. So, but the other thing is that many subway stations, inside, after you've passed the toll gate, there's a public bathroom. So you can go in there, you pack in your, your, your laptop and your MyFair reader, and then you, you can read the card again. Um, very convenient. No video surveillance there, not that I can tell. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you look at this and you repeat it with all kinds of transactions. And what you end up with is, well, um, we can do something like, this is actually post-entry, so after entering a, uh, uh, um, after entering uh, the subway station, and I can now do something like diff the hex dumps of uh, well, I, I went into a station, made a dump, and then I left the station again and made a dump again. And then you look at the diff, and you see something like this, you know. A lot of stuff is the same, but this has changed here. And you see this, you know, 0x190, which, uh, if you convert it, is something like... Um, is 400 NT dollar, which happens to be the initial value after you've purchased the card. Right, 400 is the value. I said you pay 500 NT dollars, you get 400 uh, a credit and so on. And then you see it gets replaced by 184, uh, which means entering and leaving the MRT station has just cost you 12 NT dollars, right? Because now it's 388. So you have already found, by only looking at the first diff that shows up in the hex dump, you already see that this is uh, very likely to be the amount that has been changed. And you see it has been changed here Right, uh, this was 190, it has been changed to 184, has been changed over here, and you see some strange stuff over here, which happens to be uh, the inverted value. So if you do something like, um, yeah, anyway, you, <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> it's FFFF minus the, 100, uh, the minus the respective amount. So it's uh, uh, just an inverted, a bit inverted storage. Um, you see some other changes down here. So 001 has been changed to 002. Um, five has changed to one. It's not really clear what that is. A line with zeros has been replaced with a lot of other stuff. And there are more changes further down the road which are not really clear at this point. But this is just to illustrate the actual steps um, that I did. Okay, now doing this with lots of transactions, you actually get an idea. You know, things change here, things change there. Um, then you enter the same MRT station using the same toll gate and you see, oh, you know, some numbers are the same. So this must be the specific reader identifier or the station code that represents that particular MRT station. And you start to get a feeling of what happens. 
Um, and it turns out there's, well, there's a number of different things that uh, you can find. Uh, sector two is what we've just looked at in the hex dump. It's uh, the balance. So uh, this strange storage format of having twice the same value plus once the inverted value um, actually is uh, what's called a MyFair value block. This is a feature of the MyFair card itself where uh, it is intended, you have this block, it has, it represents the value, in this case, $480, and you have two different keys. One key can always only decrement the counter, and the other key, you can write it. Now, given the fact that the keys are very easy to recover, of course, it misses the point, but at least until people have figured out how to recover the keys and, and do the cryptographic attacks, this was how the system was being designed. And the inverted storage is so you cannot flip single bits and make it work. So you have the backup copies and the inverted one, um, which means if you often, in, if you... Um, if you use like uh, ultraviolet write uh, or something on, on the on the EEPROM or flash storage, then you can only switch the bits in one direction but not the other. So by storing it, the, the value and the complement value, um, if you use, use light or anything like that or uh, to, to flip bits in the hardware, you would, you would not be able to have a consistent reading again after you did that. So that was the idea of this system. Yeah, the value, as I said, one-to-one -one represents the account balance of the card in NT dollars. Um, it's not really uh, anything else uh, about that. There come some other sectors which uh, I uh, have discovered to be the transaction log. It uh, contains log information. Uh, uh, the number of, uh, the last couple of operations that this card has been done, stuff like a transaction identifier, the cost, like the, the amount of money that was involved, the remaining balance, at which particular uh, MRT station it happened, um, you know, the RFID reader ID, was it entering the station, leaving the station, connecting is again a different operation, or purchasing something in cash, or actually recharging the card using a recharge machine. There's a timestamp associated, which conveniently is a 32-bit uh, Unix time format uh, in, in seconds since the epoch. However, it refers to Chinese standard time, not to UTC. So, uh, yeah, well... well. Uh, otherwise, it's the same. I was a bit surprised to see it like this because in, in Taiwan, the calendar starts in 1911, right? So right now we have the year 99, but they still use Unix timestamps here. So, um, probably not enough political influence on the manufacturer. Um, so uh, the MRT station code, how do we decode it? I mean, for adding, amount, for adding money to it is not really important, but it was, I, I wanted to understand what's going on. So. It's the MRT station code. So you see, if you go to one station, you have 10. You go to another station, you have 12. Now, you could go to each and all of the stations, and uh, you know, then you create your mapping. This is the station name in English and Chinese, and that's the hexadecimal number that represents it on the card. would be very tiresome. What was actually much easier is to go to the home page, which has a nice map of the MRT system, and you put your mouse onto one of these station names, and in the URL line, the last three digits <laughs> is the... is the station code. Um, in, in decimal, though, you still need to convert it to hacks. OK, now, there's another interesting block or sector. It's sector 7 that contains the last MRT entry or exit record, which is, uh, well, it contains the MRT station code and a timestamp. Um, and it's used uh, to compute the um, sort of, how can I say, uh, it's not distance, it's difference, or, well, anyway. So, when you switch from, from subway to a bus, or switch between subway lines, um, then there is a discount. It's not as expensive as doing a bus ride and a, a, an MRT ride. And using the information in there, they discover you know, what kind of means of transport have you used last, and when was that? Do you, are you eligible for the discount? There is a maximum daily spending. You cannot spend more than $3,000 per day on a, with the single card. Um, you can charge up to 10000 on the card, but the daily limit is 3000 and in sector 15, block 2, at offset uh, 3, 0, um, you have a record that contains the amount of money you have spent on a given day of the month. So it contains the day of the month. So let's say uh, today is whatever, 29th. So it would mean 29, and you've spent whatever, $1,000 so far on that day. And uh, this is checked in all the transactions. And if that value reaches 3,000, the card is refused from any further uh, transaction, as long as the day of the month is the same. Using the ski, as far as I understand it, um, if you were to wait exactly until the same day of the month happens next month, 
you would not be able to use the card. But I'm not entirely sure. Maybe there's something in the data format that I didn't understand. And I, I wasn't there for a month to, at, the, at that trip to actually validate that. Now, tempering with the card. Well, after we, understand, after we have the, recovered the keys and we understand the data format, um, tampering with the card, of course, is easy. We can do um, purchases on the tempered card to validate whether it really is an online or offline system. And possible manipulations are pretty obvious. We can decrease the value on the card, thus lose money. We can increase the amount of value on the card, gain money. And we can also bypass the daily spending limit by just resetting it so you can spend even more in a single day. Um, we could also do things like recharge it to even more money than you can charge it to, but I think that would start to become suspicious. Or people would think you're like a government official, I don't know. Um, <laughs> somebody who has extra privileges, no idea. Um, or whether the readers would actually accept it. So the first thing to do, of course, is decrease the value of the card. You make a purchase in a store, um, you find the transaction log entry, you increase, you retroactively increase the cost of the purchase. So you've purchased something for $100, you increase it to 400, and then you decrement the value block storing the, the account balance, the card balance by the same amount, and suddenly you have a card that's completely consistent with itself, um, but has less money. Um, you can also, uh, you ha also have to order the amount you've spent on that day because suddenly you've spent more money on that day to make sure everything again is in a consistent state. Um, now, uh, let me just uh, show you, um, I'm going to introduce that tool in a second. So they, I've written a program called Easy Tool. Um, and I can do something like, well, post MRT entry. Uh, so what we get here is the unique identifier of the card. Uh, the day of manufacture of the card, we get the current account balance, $480. This was when I started. No purchases today. I have entered the Liu Zhangli uh, station, um, and I haven't left any station yet, because that was after entering the station with a newly purchased card. And you see the transaction log has, again, two copies of the same record. This is the date, timestamp, and so on, um, and the amount of dollar that's still remaining on the card. Now, after leaving, there was a different timestamp, of course. Uh, yeah, after leaving that very same station, the card looks a little bit different. Well, we only have 388 NT dollars left. Um, we have left the same station at exactly four minutes after entering it. Uh, huh? Well, you could have left something at home and you need to, you know, go back home and grab your laptop or something and then and, and go back. Um, so, uh, transaction log. Also, if you're a foreigner a tourist, of course you get lost. You leave the same station again. Um, so, uh, you see the transaction ID gives you one is the first transaction and two is the second transaction. You will again see everything is copied twice. I didn't order it by date or transaction ID or something. It just dumps it in the order that's written on the card. So we have leave MRT, enter MRT, and so on. It has cost me 12 NT dollars and 388 is remaining. And if I do the same with further, um, further, well, um, where is it? I actually went to Starbucks and had a coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, so, well, anyway. So, um, we have a shop purchase of 95 NT dollar, which is, I think, as, as much as a coffee frappuccino tall size is uh, in uh, Starbucks, Taiwan. Um, yeah, and we have 293 NT dollars left on the card. So, the, the format is very well understood at this point. Um, we can decode everything, we can read the transaction log, and so on. Um, now, manipulating, yeah, as I said, decreasing the value is the first attempt we can do. Um, the other thing, of course, is, uh, well, uh, we can do it, and uh, it has been done. Um, card behaved life expected. So uh, it had less value remaining, not only in easy tool, but also when you go to the shop. Um, it was still possible to use it anywhere, in shops and in public transportation. Um, the artificially removed money could not, spend, could not be spent. So when the card reached zero, you could not spend any more money, meaning that the value stored on the card is really the value that the system respects, not some value in the back end. And uh, the card could still be recharged at recharge machines. So even at the recharge machines, they didn't know what's the real value of the card, but they just read what's on the card and incremented it and write it back to the card. Um, right? I would have expected at least a recharge machine to have some online connection and a shadow account in a database where you then can correct the, the offset, but that was not the case. By the way, this was my second attempt. The first attempt, the card actually failed. I couldn't buy what I wanted to buy. So um, uh, there, I, I made some inconsistency in, in the data structure. But yeah, it, it was second attempt uh, was then working. 
Now, the next thing, of course, you can do is increase the value on the card, um, right? Um, it's not really that different, right? You, you find a transaction log and you decrease the cost of the previous purchase. So let's say you buy something for $380 and you suddenly retroactively make it cheaper to $180, which gives you an extra 300. You increment the value block accordingly. You manipulate um, the amount spent per day in sector 15 to affect the re reflect the reduced amount and suddenly you have more money on the card. It has been done. Um, and the card behaved like expected. It had more value remaining. It was possible to use it in stores and public transport. Um, and you could spend all the money to the last NT dollar, even the money that you didn't really have. Um, just the card said you have it. So um, once again, proof that it's an offline system. There's no online database check. And the card could again still be recharged at recharge machines without losing the artificially incremented added amount of money. So just as a note, the money that was artificially added um, was immediately really added to the card later and then manipulated back. So, right, there's no fraud involved in this. So what happened is the card didn't have money, it was artificially recharged, something has been bought, just to prove the point, then the card was actually recharged using the, money, the, uh, the amount of money that was uh, artificially added previously, and then it was manipulated to reduce that amount of money. So in the end, the balance was the same, and all the money that has been spent has actually been spent in cash. So there's no fraud involved in this. OK, now, um, then there's this program, Easy Tool, as I already showed. It understands the format. It also has code for adding and like incrementing and decrementing the, uh, the amount. Uh, it has not been released uh, to anyone. And um, I'm thinking of releasing a read-only version where you can just, I mean, it, it doesn't crack any keys, it doesn't recover keys, it doesn't do anything cryptographically. Assuming you have the matching keys to a card um, uh, with the version I intend to release, you can read the stuff that I have been reading, but there's no, the manipulation code I do not intend um, to release publicly. So let me just go through some more examples. So if we go further in the history of this, what, what happened? So I went to another store and bought something, da, da 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 I think this is not a card that had been tampered with. Just to show you a card that has some more transactions, um, it just uh, yeah, looked like this. So you see some different station names, some different uh, values, some different amounts, different shop purchases. Um, but I can show you the actual um, Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so this is a card that I had been used. So originally it was charged with $1,000 NT. Um, it had a value of 237 NT, and I just bought something. The last transaction identifier, C3 here, this is the last transaction. I bought something for $75 NT, and, um, and I manipulated the card to increase the, the cost of the C3 transaction to $275, leaving only $37 NT remaining, right? This is the decrease part. So I decreased, I increased the cost of the last purchase and I decreased the total amount. And then, um, yeah, well, uh, if we continue the log, uh, yeah, there was some, some, some stuff, yeah, that it was, that it didn't work, but then, yeah, this is after spending some additional, in a C4 transaction, some spending some additional 20 NT dollars in bottled green tea um, at a convenience store. So uh, from 37 NT dollars, we get reduced to 17 NT dollars. So this was the shop purchase. And um, well, after we look at the next transaction, we see stuff like, um, uh, I'm trying to find uh, the increased transaction here. Not quite sure whether it's in this log file, but it's uh, pretty much the same thing. Yeah, this, uh, this I think is, is a modification of 175. Uh, yeah, I have to check. Maybe it's a different card where I actually added some value, but I think you get the point. Um, you get the point of, of this entire exercise. So, um, yeah, using a MyFair Classic or any RFID system based on proprietary security that's based on security by obscurity, I think it's extremely irresponsible. 
And using a MyFair Classic-based public transport system, which may provide sufficient level of security for public transportation, using that in the year 2010 as a payment system is, I think, ignorant, clueless, and a sign of gross negligence by whoever is in charge of this. I think government regulators should mandate the use of uh, independently audited and reviewed security technology. Security by obscurity is not an answer to any problem. Well, my thanks slide to the various people who have made uh, this possible. Um, as I said, I didn't do anything uh, in this case, uh, but uh, actually look at hex dumps and find out what it was. It actually reminded me a lot to something like, you know, 16, 18, 20 years ago when I was modifying saved games uh, uh, on, on, on the PC or the C64, right? It's not really that different. You go into the game, you do something, you, 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 you look at the hex dump and you see where is the value for the amount of credits I have or for the amount of whatever ammunition or God knows what it is. It's not really any different in this case. Um, you know, adding, adding the, the sort of uh, three hour key cracking time um, for that. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. Well, Harold, you're very ahead of time, so we've got lots of time for questions. Uh, sorry? Easy Card Corporation knows about these problems. In fact, years before they, made, they, they went live with the, uh, the, the payment system, I mean, it was still used for public transportation only, um, researchers from various Taiwanese universities have uh, tried whatever they could, you know, writing letters to the government and to the company and so on, warning them of doing this, but uh, they still did it. And there is, there's a group of researchers at National Taiwan University um, which have done uh, similar modifications um, uh, than I did. Uh, I didn't, I only just spoke about them after I did it. Um, and they are using different sort of less effective attacks. So they, they have a USRP in a backpack and, you know, it's sort of much more cumbersome. They don't do card-only attacks. They actually have to sniff the communication between the card and the reader in order to get the keys. So different, different attack vector, but they have done the same thing. They have added value to the card. And they have actually done it on their student ID cards, which also have easy card functionality, which are clearly tied to, them, to themselves. And, and they have done this a couple of, you know, must be about a year ago now, um, and they've never been contacted, and there's never any inconsistency has showed up with that particular <laughs> student or the card or something. It was, nothing happened. So um, they, they could very clearly know, um, uh, and as I said, they've been warned by the local academia very, very strongly, um, and uh, they still decided to deploy the system, which, uh, well, I, I don't know how this comes, but it's not my, my business either. Okay, question, if you've got questions, can you put your hand up, please, and we'll get a mic to you. Um, can I get the, one of the audio angels to hand up? To He's gone, hasn't he? Oh, no, there you go. Okay, yep, you, right. you first. Hi, hi uh, I just wonder, um, other than RFID card you've uh, played in Taiwan, have you ever come across a car RFID system in mainland of China, say Shanghai or Beijing? I've been to Shanghai and uh, other places in mainland China. Mm, I think I actually have some of these cards, but it's, uh, I never really had time to look at it. As I said, it's, I mean, I also have cards from Rio de Janeiro and, and Sao Paulo and, and other places wherever I go and, and use public transportation. But as I said, I never really had uh, the, the intention or the time uh, to, to look deeper into this. In, in Taiwan, this was just as I happened to be there that often. And uh, this is, all this work was done in two days, by the way. It was uh, very, very quick. Uh, and very, very simple. But then I had a lot of existing experience with RFID systems. But still, it's, um, it's really not a very, very difficult thing. I have no idea how other transportation systems uh, uh, work or what they use. I know in Japan uh, they use um, a system called Felica, um, uh, which is based on triple DES as far as I know. So the encryption is much stronger than my Fair Classic, but I don't know what's used in, in Shanghai or, or, or uh, other Chinese uh, cities, sorry. Yeah, because uh, recently I just got this uh, RFID card from uh, Shanghai. Um, the manufacturer claimed this is going to be uh, the, their solution to replace the MyFair card, and they are using their own proprietary algorithm to, to, to protect. So I think <laughs> my, if you got time, maybe this can be one of your next projects, or anyone here. 
Yeah, to... yeah. I, I personally have to say I'm, I'm too busy. I have too many projects going on. This was just, you know, two days in Taiwan, uh, just for fun. Um, now, the, uh, just one comment you said, you know, somebody's advertising, you know, we have our own proprietary crypto to replace the other <laughs> crappy proprietary crypto. I mean, they've said enough. I mean, it's, it's sufficient for me to say, well, you know, go away. Um, you know, why don't you just use AES or, or DES or, you know, something that's, you know, generally well audited and generally well understood and, and where people think, you know, there's a sufficient level of, of, of uh, security involved. Um, proprietary encryption, I don't think it's going to work. Um, yeah, more questions? Okay, fellow uh, in the beard. I, okay, I think this fellow from China wants to save money on public transport. Um, but um, I think in Germany there's also a card system. Some there's, there's a standard from the VDV Verein or the Verband Deutscher Verkehrsverbünde or Verkehrsunternehmen. The um, okay in English. Okay, they, they standardize all this um, this this stuff with, with stamping machines or the displays in the bus that says next station so and so. There's this all this stuff is standardized and also they have a smart card based system. But I think it's deployed in Hannover or something. It should be possible to make some further investigations if this is a good system or not, because I think it's some years old and so maybe has some flaws. Yeah, yeah, that might very well be the case. As I said, it's a, I've, I've sort of left the RFID world uh, in 2006. It was just uh, you know I, I made uh, one one attempt and I was very lucky to find such an extremely uh, I don't know uh, welcoming system. Um, <laughs> sorry, an easy system, um, it, but yeah, I have no idea about Hanover, but uh, of course, I mean, as I said, just go ahead, RFID readers are not expensive, all the documentation is out there, the protocol stacks, the, the implementations of the various MyFair classic attacks, uh, just uh, check for yourself, it's, uh, uh, it's no, no magic involved. Okay, other questions? If you put your hand in the air, please. Okay, so that fellow there, and then... Um, you in the shirt that I can't read. <laughs> the My Fair break was hardly kept hush hush over the past couple of years, particularly here at CCC. Um, so I imagine the guys involved know these cards aren't too secure, yet they're pushing ahead anyway. Do you have any insight as to how much it would cost them to roll out something half decent? Um, well, uh, the typical claim that the companies, the proponents of these systems make is that it's so horribly expensive to do. Um, but then, I mean, okay, you have to go back one step. Uh, so what is the cost of deploying an alternative system? Last time I checked, and this was already in 2006, a MyFair DES fire card providing, you know, triple DES encryption, um, even at that time, was less than one US dollar more expensive than the MyFair Classic card. So the, the cost on the card side is that, yeah, you have to spend less than one US dollar more on each of the cards, which I think, you know, given that you charge for the cards anyway as a deposit or something, shouldn't be a, a problem. The other part is that, of course, in the readers, you then need to implement triple desk um, um, and uh, uh, I have to have that in hardware or in software or on your microcontroller or something. Uh, but then again, we have the problem. I think it's actually the same problem we see in GSM based stations that people buy, people design, develop, sell, and buy such systems without previously thinking of in the field software upgrades and of having sufficient resources left over, as in flash and RAM and CPU processing power, to upgrade systems after they have been deployed. Um, and that sort of is, is a claim that has been made by numerous companies. And uh, I also think EasyCard has, has mentioned this against some of the, uh, uh, to the, some of the academic uh, uh, guys in, in Taiwan, that uh, yeah, they just cannot implement triple desk in all their readers because uh, they don't have the available uh, flash or whatever uh, uh, program memory in, in those readers to actually put all the code in there. Um, but yeah, then I think the initial investment is already broken because yeah, buying hardware that's supposed to be there for decades uh, without thinking of future proof and upgradability is uh, again, I would say, of a security related technology is negligent. Um, in, in, I'm sorry, it's sort of off topic, but I, I know more about the GSM side of things and there you can think that in, I think the GSMA 
has, yeah, in a GSMA statement, in 2009, they have the operators have started to think, started to think whether they should mandate in the future that cryptographic algorithms should be a software only upgrade in their equipment, right? So, so 19 years or whatever after GSM has first been deployed, they start to think whether in the future, maybe it's a good idea to keep algorithms as a software upgrade without having to replace the hardware. And that's sort of an, you know, some, some idea of how the hardware industry, I don't know, I don't know where they Puzzle live. Thing. They live on the Mars or something. Okay, um, where are we? This gentleman here, and then we'll take a question from IRC. Okay, it's not just a question, but an um, experience I had myself. Um, I'm from a university, and um, we have a payment system which is based on um, MyFair. And I was just doing some research, um, in fact, the exact same thing as you did. And uh, we do pay um, by MyFair, and it's as insecure as uh, this um, thing from Taiwan. So, um, and I know that other universities in Germany um, do have the same um, technique as we have. So, it's, it's common also in Germany. Yeah, um, I'm not doubting that it is uh, common here. Um, I'm just uh, not sure whether, for example, there are 18 million students having such cards in Germany. I would be surprised. So the, the deployment size uh, of this system in Taiwan is, is definitely quite uh, large. Um, yeah, but once again, even to those universities, I mean, it, yeah, it comes back to uh, the, the actual cost of the equipment is not you know, not too high, too much higher. If you, if you want to have something uh, that's that offers a higher level of security, um, and one one thing I once heard from NXP was that they've never considered the MyFair Classic as a security product internally. It was, you know, they never thought of it as a security product. It, they have their secure uh, smart cards like Smart MX and and uh, the Desfire and so on, and the MyFair was, you know, was just was never intended as a secure product in the first place. And uh, yeah, but then you have companies that always try to save the last couple of cents without thinking of security, and that's, that's what we see all over the industry. And uh, then you end up with problems. And of course, fixing the problem now after having deployed 18 million cards and God knows how many tens of thousands of readers is going to be a very expensive proposition. Um, you know, having it fixed from the first time would probably be, have been less, much less expensive in, you know, but well. And now we'll take a question from IRC. Yeah, um, the interwebs were discussing that um, in Amsterdam they introduced MyFair for public transport just this year, just as a side remark. And um, they were also discussing uh, how you could make such a system more secure. So um, would you, could you think of any way of having a payment system using MyFair get more secure, so they suggested like a server side based system or online system? Yeah, that's what I mentioned initially, right? If you have an online system, which many people again believe is too expensive, but if you have an online system, then of course uh, nobody can artificially add money. All the threat you, you have remaining then is a cloning threat or something like that, where you can just clone somebody else's card and then spend his money. Um, which uh, is uh, still remaining at that point. And I think, you know, what are we talking about? About less than one US dollar for each card. Come on. I mean, why, why is anyone arguing about that, about that amount of money? I don't understand why there's such a big problem to, to buy a, a more secure card. Um, Yeah, but go and ask the users, you know, go and ask the users. If, if, if you go to a user and say, you know, do you want to pay one dollar more uh, but to have a card that uh, uh, nobody can, can clone and uh, uh, can spend your money, then everyone would say, of course I pay one dollar more. There are lots of people who's, who spend money every month on having their ISP run a firewall for them, right? If people are willing to pay money for it. So you just, you just say, yeah, you know, you want a more safe, safer card, pay one dollar more. Um, why not? Mm. Okay, uh, this gentleman here. And do we have any other questions? If you've got a question, put your hand up, please. Um, anyone, any others? Oh, one there. What any others? Oh, and that gentleman over there in the back. Okay, cool. Take it away. What is the approximate uh, price for a card for um, 
um, companies like MRT for a single card or for 1,000 cards? I have no clue, to be honest. Um, I mean, as I said, last time I was researching anything about pricing in RFID cards was in 2006, and only the quantities like uh, uh, 1,000 units, right? And th that's the quantities we bought for our open PCD cards. And there I think it was something like uh, 40 cents for a, a, a MyFair Classic and $1.20 or something for a, an a desk fire. But this is, you know, four years ago, the prices may have changed quite a bit um, by now. Um, I have, and, and also in larger volume, um, yeah. Okay, okay, and we've got five minutes, so that's probably one or two more questions. So, uh, this gentleman, who, who wants to ask? It was, yeah, it was you. you. Um, have you tried whether they do an online check when you go for a refund? I've never gone for a refund, no. I, I, to be <laughs> honest, I only read about it, I wouldn't even know where to go. I would have to check where to go to get a refund, no. Um, no. I don't think that's a very good idea. But, but let's not do that. <laughs> a Taiwanese prison is not cool. <laughs> okay, and uh, we have time for one more, and then uh, uh, Harold uh, will, I don't know, where are you planning on going after this? I have, I have just uh, a comment. So it, in universities where you have these things to buy your Mensa food or stuff, uh, there are some, also some universities where you can your study fees with this card. And so if you have problems with your finance and you find the thing that the study fees are too much, maybe you can do something against it. So there's uh, one chap there and then we'll uh, call it because you've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, uh, maybe in order to raise awareness in the minds of the people responsible for such systems, uh, maybe it would... Uh, uh, be an option to go the fire sheep way and create an, a trivial uh, a program that is so trivial to use that it could be used really by uh, a lot of people easily. Um, for somebody who really cares about the deployment of such um, uh, weak systems, maybe that's the only way to go. A um, trivial RF, a, a trivial micro breaking toolkit. Well, I think it's already fairly fairly easy to do, um, but uh, well. Um, you know, I think uh, the attacks have been publicized very well and very widely, um, especially in the Netherlands and in the UK. And, uh, you know, I've, uh, yeah, I, to, just one more statement. I just remember that I had a conversation with a large telecommunications operator in Europe uh, recently. And they also use uh, one of the, not my fair, but one of the competing but equally bad security-wise <laughs> systems. Um, and they said they are desperately looking for a supplier. I mean, this is a large telecommunications company. We're talking about, you know, hundreds or th no, actually thousands of locations where these readers and door access control systems and so on are deployed it's for access control to all of their, their facilities. And they said they have not been able to find any single supplier that would use uh, a, a, a RFID card with decent level of security in their system. It's, they, they, they could not find it on the market. Right. So there's a clear failure of the market to provide adequate level of security. They, they would even want to buy it, but they cannot find a supplier for it. Right. The cards are there, you know, the customers are there, but somehow the, the access control industry is, uh, I don't know, sleeping. I smell a business opportunity for someone enterprising in the audience. <laughs> <laughs>